Today we have a really special guest, Dr. Marshall Rosenberg, who's the founder of a process called Nonviolent Communication. And I think as we talk to, uh, to Marshall Rosenberg, we'll hear that indeed what we thought was limited in human ability to communicate, to share, and to understand is, I feel, with his method, really unlimited. So thank you, Marshall, for joining us. I'm very glad to. How, how did you develop this process of nonviolent communication? Well, I started it by some questions that have been in me, deep in me, since I've been very young. Why do some people uh, respond compassionately to others, and why are others so violent? So those questions got me started. I studied clinical psychology, hoping that this would give me some insights into this. But what I saw in clinical psychology was really a perpetuation of the violence, because it was based on looking at people who behave in ways we don't like as though there's something wrong with them, as though they're mentally ill. And at that time, I was starting to see that this was part of the problem, this kind of labeling of people, this kind of dehumanization that comes through our language, in which we think in terms of wrongness. So uh, I then started to study people who were really living in the way that I valued, to try to see what contributed to their being able to stay compassionate even in the face of violence around them. Can you give examples of some of these people? Well, in my book I mentioned uh, one of them. I was very fortunate as a young boy to uh, have an uncle who came to our house each evening. And my grandmother was totally paralyzed and was on a bed in the dining room. And each evening he would come home from his hard work. He worked eight hours. And then he would come over to our house and help my mother take care of my grandmother. And the whole time he was taking care of her, he had the most wonderful smile on his face. Well, whereas in the streets I was seeing the smile on the people's faces who were beating me because I was Jewish, and the observers watching it and enjoying it, I saw that kind of smile, and then I came into my house and I saw the smile on the face of my uncle as he was taking care of my grandmother. And of course I saw many such examples of people like my uncle, that no matter what's going on around them, they got more pleasure out of contributing to people's well-being than getting caught up in the violence. Can you explain a little bit what nonviolent communication is, or the non... The, the, because you mentioned in our, you know, even in our words, even in our language, it can be alienating and we can view others uh, blaming them, judging them, and not allowing the goodness to come forth. What nonviolent communication is, is really a synthesis, not only of communication, but of intentionality, consciousness about how we choose to live. So nonviolent communication begins with getting people clear of this consciousness, uh, a life-serving consciousness that we call it. And then we show them language that we think, language and communication, that we see serving life-serving consciousness. And now the process itself, the language and communication, is remarkably simple. Almost everybody who studies it says two things about it, how simple it is. The next thing they say, how difficult it is. Now, now what makes it simple <laughs> is that it basically suggests that we keep our consciousness at all times on two things. What's alive in us? And what would make life more wonderful? See, What's alive in us? What's alive in others? What would make life more wonderful for us? What would make life more wonderful? Now, that's simple. However, what makes it complicated, we haven't been taught to think and communicate in terms of what's alive in us. We have been taught to think in terms of moralistic judgments. Who's right? Who's wrong? Who's normal? Who's abnormal? So when you have been educated for about 10,000 years as we have, to think and communicate in moralistic judgments, which incidentally, um, all of the basic religions have warned us for centuries, do not use moralistic judgments. Christian tradition says it very clearly, judge not others lest ye be judged. Right. But we hear that, but we have been trained from the time we've been infants 
to think in terms of moralistic judgments. Our parents and teachers use moralistic judgments with us. That's a good girl. That's a bad boy. That's, that's a very smart thing you did. That's a stupid thing you did. So having been trained so thoroughly for so long in moralistic judgments, it's very difficult for people to do what our training shows how to do, which is stay conscious moment by moment what's alive in us and what would make life more wonderful. Now, the what's alive in us basically focuses on human needs. What needs of yours are being met at a given moment? What needs are not being met? What needs of others are being met, not being met? And then the what could make life more wonderful means what do we want? What requests do we have to contribute to human needs being better met? So that's the simplicity of the process. What's alive in us and what would make life more wonderful? And so when you're going out and you're using this in the, in the case of a corporation, how you would say the corporation has a need for profits. We, we show that profits are not a need. A very important part of our training is to help people see a difference between needs and strategies. See, strategies are ways of getting needs met. So some people think that profits, financial gain, is a need. No, it's a, it's a strategy that might or might not meet certain needs. See. What would be a need of a corporation? Well, uh, the need of the people in the corporation the str would probably, I hope, be the strongest need that human beings have, a need to contribute to life. Right. Some people would call this a need for meaning, some would call it a need for purpose, but I call it a need to contribute to life, to see that our efforts are really going to serving life, making somebody's life more wonderful. That's what all of the corporations, I think, say in their vision, that basically that they are trying to serve people. But when you really look at their actions, I think that they're getting needs mixed up with strategies, and their real interest is in how to make profits. Why, why is that? What is? Well, because for 10,000 years, we have been educated to live within domination cultures in which a few people benefit at the expense of many. So, uh, people in the, the structures, they have been educated this way. They really uh, see that this is the world for those in power to get their needs met and to use others in, in, the, in the service of their own needs. Now, that trickles down into the rest of society where you, even in a, in a marriage, uh, each partner fears to be dominated by the other. Yes, if you have uh, people educated in a domination structure, uh, much of the, uh, the, the definitions of what love means is all mixed up with domination. Can you elaborate on that? Yes. Uh, for example, uh, we often work with people uh, who are having trouble in their marriages. And we ask them first, what are your needs that are not getting met? Uh, one time a woman uh, said to her husband, well, my need for love isn't getting met. And he says, well, I love you. And she says, no, you don't. He says, yes, I do. I said, hold it. What, re what are you requesting of him when you say that your need for love isn't getting met? What do you want him to do to better meet your need for love? She, sa she looked at him and said, well, you know. And he says, no, I don't know. Well, she says, it's hard to say in so many words. And he said, if it's hard for you to say, can you see how hard it will be for me to do? <laughs> so I said to her, so tell him concretely, what do you want him to do to meet your need for love? And then she looked at me and she says, it's embarrassing. I said, yes, it's often embarrassing to see the oppressive games we're playing in the service of getting certain needs met. So what do you want him to do to meet your need for love? She says, I want you to guess what I want before I even know what it is. And then I want you always to do it. <laughs> you see, well, that's a very domination uh, kind of concept because uh, you play the game that if you really love me, you would know what I want and do it. So people don't usually say that out loud, but they keep that within because that's how you, t you, you oppress people within a domination culture. You try to use guilt by saying, if you love me, you would do this. 
Why do we think that somebody else is responsible for our happiness? Because we all seem to grow up believing that. It, and it's so hard to stop blaming and saying somebody else caused well, our uh, happiness or un unhappiness. That's, again, because in a domination culture, you want to use guilt as a tool for getting people to do what you want. Our training shows that there are certain strategies that are very destructive in trying to influence people. One is punishment, another is reward, another is guilt, which we're talking about now, another is shame, and another is are the concepts of duty and obligation. But let's look at guilt because it relates to this oppression of trying to com communicate to other people that they're responsible for our feelings. See, if you want to manipulate children by guilt, for example, you have to teach them very young that they can make other people feel bad. So uh, a mother or father might say to the child, it hurts me when you don't clean up your room. And if the child has been educated to believe that you can make people feel as they do, then the child's going to feel guilty to see that his behavior creates such pain. In our training, we show people that it's very important to be conscious of what we are responsible for and what we're not responsible for. Because if you don't get that clear, then you get what in modern terminology is called a blurring of the boundaries or codependence, you see, when you don't get these concepts of responsibility clarified. So we suggest that we are responsible for our intentions and our actions. How others interpret our actions or our intentions is what creates their feelings. And we can't be responsible for something over which we have no control. I can control my intentions. I can control my actions. I'm responsible. So I have the intention to express honestly to you something that you've done that is not in harmony with my needs. That's my intention. And I do it the best way I can. I say to you, I'm frustrated when you keep interrupting when I talk because I have a need to be understood and, and, my, and be respected that isn't met. Now, you say, that hurts me when you say that. See? Now, what hurt you? It would hurt you if in... <coughs> I, I say it, it hurts me because uh, I feel that I haven't figured out what you needed. If you said that, I, I'm feeling hurt because I'm not clear. Notice you're saying I'm feeling hurt because I. You're taking responsibility. Uh -huh. So that would be in harmony with what we're showing people. But if when I said what I did, you took it as a criticism, you hear that you're being criticized and feel hurt, it wouldn't be my statement that hurt you. It would be how you received it. Right. You received it as a criticism. Right. So therefore, we are responsible for how we feel because how we feel depends on how we interpret things. Other people are responsible for their intentions and their actions, but not for how we interpret them and not, therefore, for how we feel. So, so basically, we get clear ourselves and we're confident of our needs and feelings and to go about getting these needs met. And then in the process of interacting with other people, we hold this clarity and we can kind of like keep pulling them up even if they start to say they're unworthy. It, in, they won't say it in words, but maybe through their actions. Or their well, in our training, we, one of the things that people like most about our training is that its utilization doesn't depend on the other person's cooperation. So we can show people how to stay with the process that will end with everybody's needs getting met, even if the other person doesn't have the skills to communicate in this way. So, for example, in that, what we were talking about earlier, if I say to somebody, I'm feeling frustrated when you start to talk before I finish, because I have a real need for, you know, space to communicate. And the other person gets hurt and says, that hurts me when you say that. I might say to the person, could you tell me what you heard me say? Yes, you said I was rude. Right. You see, okay, so now I can see that the problem wasn't what I said, it's how they took it. So I say thank you. Why do I say thank you? I ask them to tell me what they heard. They did. See, If I said that isn't what I said, 
they'd hear it as an attack. So I say thank you. I can see I didn't make myself clear. I was trying to communicate my feelings and needs, not criticize you for what you did. Let me try again. Right, right. I'm feeling frustrated because my need for space to communicate doesn't get met. Can you tell me what you heard? I'm sorry. Before you apologize, could you tell me what you heard? See, to get another person who's not trained to be conscious of what's alive in us, they've been trained to hear criticism, to make criticism. I'm not saying it's easy to pull their attention so they can hear what's alive in you, but you can do it. We teach people then how to help the other person to hear a difference between you criticizing them and you're simply expressing what's alive in you. So that kind of answers the question I had about a nonviolent communication not being used to control or somebody or achieve a certain end, even to, to try to achieve a, a connection with them so that they know what we're feeling. Uh, it could be viewed by some as manipulation because you're trying to make them feel what you're feeling. But it seems to me what you're saying is that other people can actually be taken to a place where they not only understand what you're feeling, but they're actually having a greater repertoire of feelings themselves. We help them to develop the repertoire because our training shows us how to hear feelings behind any message that comes at you. So even if the other person has almost zero consciousness of what's alive in them, no matter what they say, we're trained to sense what they might be feeling. And in this way, we can help them get more in touch with it. Now, we need to clear up one thing about the intention of nonviolent communication. As you suggested, it's very important that we not mix up the intention of creating the, a connection in which everybody's needs can get met. That's the intention of nonviolent communication. It's not getting our way. It's not getting our way, exactly. It's not getting the other person to do what you want. But that's a very hard intention to get through to people who have been educated in a culture who interpret that it is their objective to get the other person to do what you want. For example, many parents will say to me something like what one did recently. She said, Marshall, how do I get my son to clean up his room? I said, is that your objective? She said, yes. I said, then he won't. Oh, she said, so I'm supposed to just let him do whatever he wants and I have to do all the cleaning? See, she could only see two objectives, to either get him to do what she wants or she had to be a loser and not get her needs met. I said, I'd like you to see another possibility. What we're saying is to create the quality of connection that will allow your needs to get met and your son's needs to get met. But in order for that to happen, you can't get addicted to the strategy of getting him to clean up his room. He may very well end up cleaning up the room once he sees what your needs are and trust that you are equally concerned with his needs. Maybe this process makes us get a better idea of who we are. We may come in thinking that we want something, but working with these connections with people, we may find as a result of listening to the feelings and needs of someone else, we may actually want something different, greater, better. This is why differences and conflict are wonderful. If we go about it with certain consciousness, yes, very often we come out with something far richer than we go in with in terms of various strategies that might be effective in meeting our needs. If what we go in with, we see it doesn't meet the other person's needs, through an exploration of then how can we find a way to get everybody's needs met, we often do come out with a much more creative resolution. Why, why are you so confident that everybody can get their needs met? Because I feel you're very optimistic and you're very convinced that there are no differences that can't be resolved. Many times people say, yes, how do you have this belief in the innate goodness of people? And I say it has nothing to do with a, a, a belief or a faith. In my work, I do a lot of conflict resolution and a lot of it is between people that hold deep pain between themselves. I've mediated between uh, tribes in northern Africa where a quarter of the population were killed in the year before I started to work with them. I mediate between teams of uh, groups of Hutus and Tutsis in Rwanda and Burundi. 
I'd worked in uh, Sierra Leone with uh, people who had had horrible things happen with the other pe uh, people in the room with them. I'd worked between Israelis and Palestinians. But actually, some of the, the most bitter conflicts I've been through are through uh, husbands and wives, children and, and their parents. Right. So then, in answer to your question, uh, why do I have this, uh, this, this trust that everybody's needs can get met? Because I find out that when I can get both sides hearing what the other side is needing, what needs of theirs, what human needs are not getting met, you see, and what pain do they feel as a result of that? When I can get both sides seeing that, getting rid of all enemy images so that nobody is saying the other side is wrong, oppressive, stupid, anything that implies a criticism. When I can get both sides at that level, they see each other's unmet needs. They don't hear any criticism. I've yet to find that the conflict almost doesn't resolve itself. So uh, the more I do this kind of work, the more I become convinced that the kind of conflicts that need lead nations to war and tens of thousands of people to be killed. Actually, I'm convinced that most school children could solve the conflict very quickly if you simply told them what the resources are and what the needs of both sides are. You see. But so it doesn't take a, a PhD in psychology no. to, to put this into action? It takes somebody with a consciousness of human needs and an ability to translate moralistic judgments into needs. That's a, a core part of our training, that all language that criticizes others is essentially a tragic expression of an unmet need.